You may never have encountered Anne Bonny or Mary Read before today, or might have some initial impressions of these fascinating women. Some of you will have been introduced to them by Dr Julie Wheelwright's earlier talk, or through the fantastic Man Up exhibition at Chawton House. I strongly urge you to take a look at the digitised exhibition if you haven't already. This talk delves into the myths, images and stories that surround these warrior women of the waves. My work examines the literature of piracy published in the early 18th century, thinking about the images and representations of the pirate that are conveyed by these texts. This slide gives you an idea of just some of the texts about pirates and piracy that were published before 1735. Pirates were active in the West Indies and Americas well into the 1720s, and it was through newspaper reports, trial records, and these kind of texts that British people encountered their depredations. My work focuses specifically on a general history of the pirates, which was published in many forms between 1724 and 1734, and continued to be published through the rest of the 18th century. The images and ideas represented in this text crucially inform the images of female pirates we encounter today. Open any book about piracy and the likelihood is you will encounter Anne Bonny and Mary Read. These two women, who reportedly went to sea as pirates in the early 18th century, seemingly chose to buck social expectations and embark upon an adventure into the hypermasculine world of the high seas. They not only went to sea, but chose to sail aboard pirate ships. These women have been mythologised and elevated as subversive figures who stepped into male roles. There are two 18th century publications I want to discuss today. The first is the printed edition of their trial, which was published in 1721 as the trials of Captain John Rackham and other pirates. You can find this file online, digitised by the National Library of Jamaica. This text presents the criminal charges and witness testimonies of their piratical acts in a format that is carefully framed and constructed. It tells us that Bonnie and Reed were two women who sailed aboard the ship commanded by Captain Jack Rackham, and that they actively participated in pirate activity. It describes how they piratically and feloniously set upon, shoot at, and take two certain merchant sloops, and that they piratically and feloniously did make an assault in and upon one James Dobbin and certain other mariners. The publication details how they were tried and sentenced to execution on Monday the 28th of November 1720, and describes how both women declared that they were pregnant, upon which the court ordered an examination, which could result in a stay of execution until the babies were born, at which point their sentence would be carried out. The second text is a general history of the pirates. Before I talk about the narratives it presents, I want to introduce you to this fascinating text. First published in 1724, it frequently referenced as the source for the lives of pirates active in the early 18th century. It purports to be a series of biographies of real life pirates who sailed the seas at the end of the 17th and beginning of the early 18th. 18th century. It is written by a Captain Charles Johnson, which is likely a pseudonym, and although a number of authors have been attached to the text, including Daniel Defoe and Nathaniel Mist, we do not know for certain who wrote this text. We don't have a name or an authority to attach it to. The general history is a complex and tricky text that melds fact and fiction to create narratives that interweave the verifiable with the invented, as this is part of what makes it so interesting. There are verifiable details, but there is also material that cannot be found in any other sources, including an entirely inventive captain, Captain Misson. We are presented with a book that claims to be a history of piracy, but that includes literary elements, rhetorical flourishes, and things that we know to be fiction. I approach the general history from a literary perspective, examining its representations and imaginings of the 18th century pirate. I'll begin this talk with some of the images of Anne Bonny and Mary Read that were published in the early 18th century, discuss the characters depicted by the general history and the trials of John Rackham, before finishing with a quick look at the ways in which these two women are portrayed in modern media, particularly looking at the television show Black Sails and the video game Assassin's Creed Black Flag. These modern images both draw upon the general history. Through the next 15 minutes or so, we'll think about these women and their images, this text and how it has shaped our idea of women warriors of the waves. The general history's accounts of the lives of Bonnie and Reed are positioned as subsections at the end of Captain Rackham and his crew. The accounts take up two thirds of this chapter, dwarfing Rackham's story. The structure of these two subsections mark the female pirates as different from their male compatriots. 
while the male pirate narratives begin when he becomes a pirate captain, the women's lives begin with the transgressive circumstances of their births and their early lives. A greater portion of the section is dedicated to their lives before turning pirate than their lives at sea. The representation of the unconventional circumstances of their conceptions presents the idea that women are somehow destined by nature and the transgressions of their parents to be transgressive and subversive themselves. Reed is dressed up as a boy by her mother, who pretends she is the legitimate son who died in order to hide her infidelity um, and to allow the mother to continue to collect her, her son's inheritance. Reed continues to dress as a man, is employed as a page before becoming a soldier in the army. Bonnie, meanwhile, is the product of an affair between a lawyer and one of his servants. He dresses her up as a boy um, so that he can pretend that she's a relative's child and so keep collecting the allowance given to him by his estranged wife on the condition that he no longer has any contact with the servant girl or their child. When Bonnie's identity is discovered by the wife, the family moved to Carolina, where Bonnie then lives as a woman. In these narratives, Childhood cross-dressing anticipates and renders almost inevitable their adult cross-dressing. Their identity is based in nurture. There are only three illustrations in the first edition of A General History, which are then reproduced almost exactly in the second, third and fourth editions. One of them depicts Captain Edward Thatch, better known as Blackbeard, the second Captain Bartholomew Roberts, and the third is this illustration of Bonnie and Reed. I've included Robert's illustration here for comparison. That the female pirates join the two of the most notorious men in the illustrations of this book says a lot about the profile of the women within the text and the interest that they generate. Comparing the images of Bonnie and Reed to that of Robert's, we see that the women are depicted in the garb of ordinary sailors. According to Nan Rogers in The Wooden World, at this point in time, sailors would wear short coats and a kind of trousers rather than breaches because they were practical options for mobility aboard the pirate ship. In contrast, Robert it, Roberts is depicted in the mould of a naval captain, wearing breeches and a long coat. The women are armed and ready for action, depicted in the mode of naval portraiture in front of a collection of ships. Here we have a couple of woodcuts that were published in the abridged versions of the general history. Several editions of this were published through the 1720s and 1730s, and it continued to be published into the late 18th century. These images come from the 1729 edition, which is available as an ebook on Google Books, uh, thanks to the British Library. The images show the women in action, armed with swords and hatchets, as if they're about to board a ship. There is no sense of their physical bodies communicated in these images. These illustrations echo those found in the unabridged text. Bonnie and Reed are also illustrated in the Dutch edition of A General History which was published in 1725 with an extensive collection of illustrations. You can see significant differences in these illustrations. Most notably, their breasts are exposed. Their gender not only makes them unconventional pirates, it visually marks them as different from the pirates represented in the text. It is a specific marker of their identity. Their gender is not only expressed in these images, it is foregrounded. Not only are their breasts exposed, their clothes are more form-fitting, the trousers fit more closely to their legs, the jackets are light. All of the clothes are flimsy and look like they could literally fall off. When we look back at the earlier illustrations, we see how their clothing is ill-fitted, covers the entire body from neck to feet, obscuring the female body. Sally O'Driscoll examines the representations of Bonnie and Reed in the Dutch illustrations and argues the revelation of the female pirate's breasts in the 1725 illustration of their tale can now be read in a more complex way. She comments, on one level, it is a publisher's response to what readers found interesting about the original edition, observing that it is a sensationalised and sexualised way to sell books, but it also indicates a larger concern with the female body. She goes on to say that opening the women's jackets turns them into an erotic spectacle also insists on their female physicality. The breasts of the female pirates are presented as a marker of an absolute fact, incontrovertible femaleness. Femaleness is presented as the truth of the pirates' bodies and implies that a woman's body utterly defines her. 
that is, anatomy is claimed to be destiny and sex is conflated with gender. Now, the subversiveness of the Female Pirates Act of committing violence and existing within a hypermale space is undercut by the representation of her as a body. The character's breasts are fetishized and turned into a titillating spectacle that undercuts the agency expressed through the action of becoming a pirate. So in these different images, we are already presented with differing accounts of Bonnie and Reed as female pirates, some that masculinize them and others that emphasize and fetishize their female bodies. This feeds into one of the key components of the narratives of Bonnie and Reed. Some accounts depict women that are dressed as men who pretend to be men, while others represent women whose gender was openly known amongst their pirate companions. We are offered two contrasting accounts by the two publications I discuss in this talk. The trials of John Rackham suggest that their apparel is determined by practicality. The witness statement on the left hand side of your screen describes how, when they saw any vessel, gave chase or attacked, they wore men's clothes, and at other times they wore women's clothes. A female witness similarly comments that they wore men's jackets and long trousers and handkerchiefs tied about their heads, and that each of them had a matchet and a pistol in their hands, and cursed and swore at the men to murder the deponent. She suggests that the reason of her knowing and believing them to be women then was by the largeness of their breasts. There is no suggestion that the women depicted in the publication hid their gender or pretended to be men. It offers a Bonnie and Reed that dressed in male clothing for practical reasons when they needed a greater range of movement and more flexibility than the clothing, clothing for women could afford, but that they were not disguising themselves even when confronted by their victims. The alternative offered by the general history's depiction insists that the two women are cross-dressed to disguise themselves and that this cross-dressing was not only a feature of their lives at sea, but of each woman's respective childhoods as well. We are told that Mary Reed's sex was not so much suspected by any person on board, but even Anne, herself disguised as a man, does not see through the disguise. Anne takes a liking to Mary and reveals her gender to Mary, only for Reed to let her know that she was a woman also. When Rackham is threatened by the close, close relationship between these two women who are disguised as men, he too is let into the secret. In these 18th century publications, we are presented with two different accounts of two subversive women. In the first, they openly display their gender at sea, dress according to circumstance, and perform typically male gendered acts of aggression, vile, and cursing. The second sees women adopting male dress to impersonate and infiltrate the typically masculine sphere as men, subject to the expectations of conduct imposed upon men. They are not women at sea, they are women disguised as men at sea, and that's key to their representation. Accounts of Bonnie and Reed are consistent in portraying them as aggressors, as violent and active, and as some of the most committed pirates in Rackham's crew. The general history positions them as the most capable and committed characters aboard Rackham's ship, it says no person among them was more resolute or ready to board or undertake anything that was hazardous as she and Anne Bonny, she here being Mary Reed. The text then emphasises this position in its account of the moments before the company is captured. It says when they came to close quarters, none kept the deck except Mary Reed and Anne Bonny, and one more upon which she, Mary Reed, called to those under the deck to come up and fight like men and finding that they did not stir, fired her arms down into the hold amongst them, killing one and wounding others. These women challenged the men beside them to meet the standards of physicality and commitment that they themselves display. The text depicts an exaggerated performance of masculinity by the women who cross-dress. In dressing as men, in some ways they become more masculine than their companions. Now, the trial record similarly asserts that Anne Bonny, one of the prisoners at the bar, had a gun in her hand, that they were both very profligate, cursing and swearing much, and very ready and willing to do anything on board. This is on page 19 of the trial record. Now, this account is a little more subdued than we get in the general history. Nevertheless, it suggests that the women match the men, 
and encourage their violence, but they don't overshadow the men's performance of their, their own masculinity because they are not pretending to be men. They are women acting in a masculine manner. Also central to the accounts of these two women is romance and sexuality, themes that are not conveyed in the other pirate narratives in the general history. Sexuality is largely absent in the male pirates narratives uh, in this particular text, however it is centred here. This implies that even at their most subversive, women's lives are determined by heterosexual relations and their position in relation to a man. The two women represent two ideas of female sexuality. They become kind of representative of approaches to a woman and their sexual identity. Mary Reed represents the chaste and virtuous woman. She begins her adult life disguised as a, disguised as a male sailor in a reg, male soldier in a regiment in Europe. She falls in love with one of her, her comrades and let him lets him know that he is that she is female. The text tells us love is ingenious, and as they lay in the same tent and were constantly together, she found a way of letting him discover her sex. He expects to be able to use her as his exclusive bedmate, but the text clearly tells us that Reed's chastity and virtue convince him to marry her. She proved very reserved and modest and resisted all his temptations, and at the same time was so obliging and insinuating in her carriage that she quite changed his purpose. Reed is positioned as the chaste woman who won't sleep with a man until she is married and her demeanour and actions change this man's approach to her from wanting a mistress to wanting her as his wife. This is repeated later in the text when she falls in love with a crewmate. Again, she reveals her sex to him and again a de facto wedding takes place. Um, in this case, they applied their troth to each other which Mary Reed said she looked upon to be as good as a marriage in conscience as if it had been done by a minister in church and to this was owing her great belly. So this is why she's pregnant at the, when she goes to trial in the general history. There is an insistence in this chapter on conventional male-female relations. The idea that sexual activity outside marriage is not virtuous and that even subversive women conform in some respects. In Mary Reed we are presented with the female pirate as a Madonna figure. In contrast, Anne Bonny's narrative presents a very different account of femininity. Bonny marries a penniless sailor against her father's wishes, who she abandons when she became acquainted with Rackham the pirate, who, making courtship to her, soon found means of withdrawing her affections from her husband, so that she consented to elope from him and to go to sea with Rackham in men's clothes. This pattern of expressed sexual desire continues when Bonny later takes a liking to the disguised Reed. Here the female pirate is promiscuous, sexually rapacious, unfaithful and easily turned by a handsome face. Yet she is not the victim of any male desire, as an early instance in the text demonstrates. Her temperament is emphasised. She was of a fierce and courageous temper. It was certain she was so robust that once, when a young fellow would have lain with her against her will, she beat him so that he lay ill of a considerable time. Anne's activity expresses her sexuality with whichever men she wants. She is active, she's not a passive um, female lover. Yes, Rackham seduces her, but the text suggests that she wants to be seduced, otherwise she certainly would have been able to prevent his advances. Finally, we turn to a brief description of modern imaginings of the general history, which are strongly influenced by the depictions I have discussed throughout this talk. Black Sails, a television series produced by Stars and available on Amazon Prime in the UK, ran for four series, while Assassin's Creed Black Flag is a Ubisoft published video game. Um, if you're interested in looking at how these women are represented in um, these modern imaginings, but maybe aren't interested in video games, there are a series of cutscenes on YouTube which give you all of the game's narrative that involves the two women, and they give you a good sense of how these women are characterised. Now, Bonnie appears in the first episode of Black Sails and remains a central character throughout the show's run. In contrast, Mark Reed is briefly introduced in the finale dressed in the guise of Mark, of Mark Reed, um, who goes on to adventure with Bonnie and Rackham. Portrayed by Clara Paget, Bonnie is excessively violent, taciturn and blunt, 
In the first series, she relates a time when she castrates a man for putting his testicles on her shoulders. She is openly Rackham's lover and partner and is one of the most deadly of Vane's crew. Turning to the other image on this side, we see Anne Bonny and Mary Reed as they are depicted in Assassin's Creed Black Sails. This iteration mediates between the general history and trial iterations of this, these women, adding a mythology of the game franchise to them. So Reed is initially disguised as the bastard son of William Kidd, um, who adventures with the main playable character and protagonist, um, Edward Kenway. Her, general is her gender is revealed first to Kenway and then to the rest of the character in, a, in similar circumstances um, to the general history. Bonnie, meanwhile, begins the game as a saucy barmaid who cheats on her husband with Rackham. She becomes a pirate when her husband attempts to have her punished for her infidelity and her gender is never disguised. So through this talk, we've explored the representations of the two most influential female pirates in the most influential book about pirates published in the last 300 years. Finishing with these modern representations, we begin to see how the images crafted by the general history are reflected in our cultural conceptualizations of women warriors of the waves. Thank you for tuning into this talk. I look forward to discussing it with you afterwards on Twitter.